shrink substitution. Shrink sub is a really cool technique that will allow us to integrate a whole bunch of different types of integrands. Is this 8.3 or 8.4? Uh, this is 8.4. Thank you. Yeah, shrink sub is 8.4. Uh, yeah, 8.4. So this is our trickiest section in chapter 8, 8.4. But it allows us to integrate sums and differences of squares with all sorts of different exponents and variations. So it's a really powerful technique. Um, and generally, our goal is to uh, use trigonometric substitution if we see a sum of squares or a difference of squares that look like that. So I will refer to this as a sum of squares, right there, sum of squares. This is a difference of squares with a leading one. And this is a difference of squares with a trailing one. That's what those, that's how I'll refer to those. Difference of squares with a trailing one, difference of squares with a leading one, and a sum of squares. And the idea is that if we can let u be a trig function so that we could get a, a simplification of this sum or difference of squares down to a single square, that would be beneficial. That's our goal. And we are going to use two identities for this. And let me write them both on the board just because we're going to use them a lot today. So remember that we have our Pythagorean relationships. And I showed you this triangle the other day. If you extend beyond and drop this down, this triangle here is tangent on the vertical. And it's secant on the hypotenuse. And it's one right there. So that identity we will use a lot. So we have that secant squared of theta is equal to tan squared of theta plus 1. You could also solve this for tangent and have tangent squared is equal to secant squared minus 1. And then we also have that cosine squared of theta is 1 minus sine squared. These are the three identities that we are going to use. So notice, in this first case, if we were to let u equal tangent of theta, then this would collapse to secant squared. If we were to let u be tan, we'd have 1 plus tan squared. 1 plus tan squared is secant squared. So that's our trick. Our idea is that let's let u be something so that this will simplify to a single square. So 1 minus u squared. We look over here on the right hand side, let's see, 1 minus sine squared. So if we were to let u be sine right here, we'd have 1 minus sine squared, and that difference of squares would reduce to cosine squared. Now we have u squared minus 1. Come over here, oh, u squared minus 1. If we were to let u be secant, then that would reduce from secant squared minus 1, it would reduce to tan squared. So that's the thinking behind trigonometric substitution. Take a summary difference of squares with a leading or trailing 1, plug in a trig function. It's always one of these three, sine, secant, or tangent. We don't use the other ones ever. Sine, secant, or tangent. There's only three. Sine, secant, or tangent. And try to collapse down to a single square. So, do one or ten. So here we're just summarizing what I just wrote on the board. So I've taken the sum of squares, the difference of squares with a leading one, and the difference of squares with a trailing one. So one plus u squared, we're going to let u be tangent. That's going to be u. This one we're going to let u be sine. This one we're going to let u be secant. So sine, secant, or tangent. These are the two Pythagorean identities that we use. So again, having those really quick in your mind. That visual is really helpful. You can just start moving back and forth between 
secant squared equals tan squared plus one or tan squared equals secant squared minus one. You want to be able to have that at your fingertips really quickly because we use it so much. <coughs> okay, so only these three. Sine, secant, or tan. And... I'm going to do this one first, actually. I should reverse the order. This one's easier than that one. It's an indefinite integral. It's a little simpler. Let's go with this one first. So I am always going to get myself in a position where I'm dealing with a 1, not a 36, not a square, not 36 squared. There are several, several reasons why I am going to do it this way. Um, and as we get deeper into the trig sub, I can point out why it's helpful. So we are going to use some basic facts. We know that the integral, if we know just our basic inverse integrals, um, so we know that the integral of 1 over 1 plus x squared dx, that's inverse tan. <coughs> plus c. We know the inverse secant one square root of 1 plus x squared in the denominator. That's uh, inverse sine, inverse sine. And then the inverse secant one, we'll get to that one later. But if you know your basic inverse integrals with the leading, with the ones, then you can just use reverse chain rule that like we've been doing all semester already. Instead of remembering a new integral, so for example, let's do an example here. So. If you have the integral of dx over 9 plus x squared, <laughs> instead of remembering what to do with this leading term, whether it's a 1 or a 9 or a 16, the square root of it, and then figure out if you have a 1 over a, you don't have to deal with that. If you just know your basic inverse tangent integral, you can factor out the 9 in the denominator and then use reverse chain rule. So when we factor the 9 out here, it's in the denominator. There is no 9 over here, so that means it introduces 1 in the denominator. Think about going backwards. 9 times 1 is 9. 9 times x squared over 9 is x squared. <clears throat> and then you can write that as a single square. So we'll write it as x over 3 squared. Now it's an inverse tangent form with reverse chain rule. So now we can integrate it instantly. This is 1 9. Leave a space for the reverse chain rule. That's going to be inverse tangent of x thirds plus c. What's the derivative of the quantity in parentheses here? The derivative is 1 third, so we divide by 1 third, which means multiply by 3. And that gives us our answer. So you can, if you know your basic inverse trig integral, you can always force a 1, a, a 1 there, and then you just use your basic and you use reverse chain rule. So it does two things there. One, you don't have to memorize an extra formula. You just have this basic formula which you should already have. And then it um, uses reverse chain rule, which is, of course, a very, very important skill that we've learned this semester. We use it every day, every day. So that, and then there's some other added benefits too, but we won't get to those yet. So here, what I will do is factor out a 36. So it comes out of the square root as a 6, leaving 1 minus, oh, there's no 36 there, so it puts 1 in the denominator. But I want these things written as, you know, 1 plus something squared, or something squared minus 1, or 1 minus something squared. So it's not quite written in the right form yet. We've got one more change. So this should be t divided by 6 quantity squared, dt. Now we're ready to roll. Now we look at that, we have a 1 minus u squared. We need to decide sine, secant, or tangent. So
So we look at these three identities, one minus something squared. That's where we are. So if we let p over 6 be sine of theta, beautiful. Then we're going to have 1 minus sine squared, which turns into cosine squared. And we've taken our summer difference of squares, and we've turned it into a single square. That's our goal. Turn this difference of squares into a single square. That's our goal. Take the derivative of both sides here. Substitute. So this will be 1 minus sine squared inside the parentheses, inside the square root sign. Now dt, if you're one of those that has the bad habit of not writing your differentials, there's two reasons to start writing them. One, you're going to lose points on the next test if you don't write them. And two, you will probably blow your, your trigonometric substitution because that dt needs to be written rewritten using d theta here, and that will be 6 cosine of theta d theta. So now we've converted. Gabe, question? How did we do this p over 6 is equal to sine theta? So we're choosing sine, secant, or tangent so that we get an identity. 1 minus sine squared is an identity. 1 minus Secant squared is not an identity. 1 minus tangent squared is not an identity. So we, we pick, we pick sine, secant, or tangent based on these okay, three. So we're just free to put sine or any of those. We don't set our rules to what you can. We're just okay. Yep. If you wanted to let one, if you wanted to let t over six be whatever you want, you can do it. As long as you then take the derivative and replace the differential accordingly, you can do it. You can use whatever sub you want. Yeah. So sine, secant, or tangent, we're choosing sine because 1 minus sine squared is an identity. 1 minus secant squared is not an identity. 1 minus tangent squared is not an identity. So this is the one we're targeting. So 6 and the, that comes out, we get a 36. This turns into square root of cosine squared. Square root of cosine squared is cosine. So with all these trigonometric substitution ones, there are some conditions. Like we learned, we talked about this earlier, that the square root of cosine squared is only cosine if the value of cosine is positive. We are always assuming that that's the case with these trig subs. So if we ever end up with the square root of cosine squared, it's cosine. Square root of sine squared is sine. So we're assuming that we have the proper restrictions on theta. So then this turns into 36 integral of cosine squared. And let's put our power reduction identities up here because we are going to use these so much. I mean, we've already been using them so much, but we're going to continue to be using them so much. And they have to be absolutely automatic or you're doomed to suffer. So we use those, and we use the double angle identity a ton. So those we will use to the point of pain. So this will be 36 over 2. Cosine squared is 1 plus cosine of 2 theta. So we've got that. <clears throat> this will be, we can now integrate. So that will be 18 out in front. And the integral of 1 with respect to theta, which is theta. Integral of cosine is sine. Divided by 2, reverse chain rule, plus C. Now we need to claw our way back to x. We need to figure out how to get back to x. 
Well, the first thing we're going to do is use a double angle identity. Right there. Sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. So sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. The 2's cancel. Distribute the 18. So now we're there. So we got rid of the double angle. Now we're at least to single angles. And here is where we get to be creative. We come back to our statement right here. Sine is t over 6. So the sine of theta is t over 6. And we are going to do this every single trigonometric substitution problem. We are going to draw a triangle as if it's in quadrant 1 with an angle in standard position. So always draw it like that. And we are going to draw this triangle in a way that reflects our substitution. Sine of theta is t over 6. Sine of an angle is opposite over hypotenuse. And then we have to find the missing side using the Pythagorean theorem. So that will be 36 minus t squared within the square root. So this cool triangle, we'll call it the cool triangle. We're going to use it every single time. And it's cool because it allows us to go back and forth. It gives us a visual way to go back and forth from thetas to x's, x's to thetas. So that cool triangle is like a gateway. It's a gate, or t in this case, not x in this case. So let's see. So let's come over here. We're trying to get back, trying to get back to t. So 18 theta. Well, notice this. Theta, actually, right here, we can solve this for theta. Theta is the inverse sine of t over 6. Right? That's what theta is equal to from our original substitution. So we're going to have 18 inverse sine of t over 6 plus 18 times sine of theta. OK, well, that's t over 6 times cosine of theta. The only way we can get cosine of theta is to look at our cool triangle and say, oh, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So the cool triangle is what allows us to unravel any extra trig functions that aren't the original trig function that we chose. Any extra trig functions, if we had a tangent in there, this answer has, if this antiderivative had a tan, we could put a t over square root. If it had a secant, we could put this over this. If it had a cosecant, we could put that over that. If it had a cotan, we could put that over that. So the triangle allows us to get rid of any trig functions in our antiderivative that are not the original trig function. The original trig function can be turned into whatever it's equal to, t over 6. Which we can also look at the triangle and say, oh yeah, sine of theta is t over 6. So now we're back to where we wanted to be, back in the land of t, our original independent variable. It's a little bit of simplification. And this is the family of antiderivatives that we were looking for. That is our family of antiderivatives. So that is about as simple a trig sub as you're going to find. That is about as easy as it gets. There, there's a couple that might slip in a little bit easier maybe, but this is pretty typical trig sub. Yeah? Question. How did we get the um, this root 36 minus t squared? For right here? For the bottom, yeah. Where, how Pythagorean theorem? A squared plus b squared is c squared? So b squared is that squared minus that squared. And if you solve for b, b would be the square root of that squared minus that squared. Oh, okay. So Pythagorean theorem is going to be something that we'll use a lot to get the third side. Because with our let statement, we're always going to have two sides of this right triangle. And then we'll use Pythagorean to get whatever side's unknown. Okay. <clears throat> Other questions on it? 
So let's do another one. Let's do the one at the top. So you can do a definite integral or an indefinite integral. You can do a definite or an indefinite. This one's a definite, so let's go ahead and do this. So the first step here is just like I mentioned last time. I like to have a sum or uh, difference of squares with unity, with a 1. So I'm going to factor out that 4. So that 4 right there, I'm going to factor it out. It's in the denominator, and it's coming through a square root. So it's going to come into the denominator as a 2. Okay. It's coming through a square root, so that square root has to affect it as it comes out. There is no 4 over here. Well, multiply by 1. That's what this class is all about, multiplying by 1. So if we are factoring out the 4, we're factoring out those two 4s right there. So it introduces a 4 in the denominator. And if we write it as a single square, it becomes 1 minus x divided by 2 quantity squared. So now we're ready. <coughs> And a lot of you aren't going to need to write this 4 over 4, but if you do, just write it. It doesn't matter. That 4 and that 4 are factoring to the front as a 2, and then we have x squared over 4, which we're going to write as x over 2 squared. Because we want to write it as a single square. So we're ready for our substitution. We know that 1 minus sine squared will reduce the cosine squared. So that tells us, oh, let's let this be sine, because 1 minus sine squared will reduce the sine squared. Or 1 minus sine squared will reduce the cosine squared. So x over 2 will be sine of theta. That's what we're choosing. That's what we're going to replace x over 2 with. Take the derivative. And we have that. Now we're ready. Now we can replace everything in this integral. Actually, we're not going to have those limits. So a trig sub and a definite integral, it's very rare that you want to bother trying to find theta limits. You can. 90% of the time, we just go back and treat the limits at the very end with the original variable. So usually I'll just put stars on there, we'll go all the way through, we'll back substitute, get back to x, and then we'll use our x limits in the end. It's usually a little bit easier with trig subs than going to the theta limits. Okay, so x squared in the numerator. Turning to thetas, we look right here. x is 2 sine of theta, so x squared is 4 sine squared of theta. dx, we look right there. We multiply both sides by 2. dx is 2 cosine theta d theta. Now we go to the denominator. Square root of 1 minus sine squared. So there we've done all the substitutions. We've now converted to thetas. Stare at that for a moment. If there's any questions before we start canceling thetas out. Is there any part of that substitution you're not sure about? I have a question. If we wanted to, and I, think, I don't know, I think you might have answered this, but um, could we just substitute cosine instead of sine? You could. But is it cosine and sine are Inter interact the same way. So you could have this as sine squared equals 1 minus cosine squared and use cosine instead of sine. Traditionally, we just use sine. Okay. But you could use either. We would never use cosecant or cotangent, though. Okay. So it's always, traditionally, it's always sine, secant, or tangent, but you could do cosine, secant, or tangent. So it's not going to change things. Gotcha. All right, so let's simplify this integral. So we have one half and we have eight, so we're going to end up with a four out in front. And we're just going to put stars on the limits until we convert back to the original variable. Let's see, one minus sine squared is cosine squared. Square root of cosine squared is cosine. So this whole thing, including the root, 
and this thing right here, those cancel. All right, one minus sine squared is cosine squared. Square root of cosine squared is cosine. So the only thing left, sine squared, right there. So then we use our power reduction identity. We replace sine squared with what it's equal to over there. So one minus cosine of two theta. And the cancellation of two out in front will give us a two. We can integrate, we get theta minus sine of two theta over two. And the star limit still. We then have to use our double angle identity right there. And we'll distribute the two at the same time. So that's two theta minus sine of two theta is two sine theta cosine theta. That two and this two cancel, and then this two distributes over. So we get two sine theta cosine theta. With star limits still. Got to get back to x. All right, so now we've gotten as far as we can go without our cool triangle. So now we draw our cool triangle. It's cool because it allows us really quickly to go back and forth between x and theta. Sine of theta is x divided by 2. Rise over hypotenuse, or, you know, uh, opposite over hypotenuse. And then this has to be the square root using the Pythagorean theorem, 4 minus x squared. Now, we see that we have a theta down here. If we look up here, we can isolate theta by moving the sine function to the other side, inverse sine of x over 2. So we're ready to back substitute. So we have 2 times inverse sine of x over 2 minus two times sine of theta, which is x over two, times cosine of theta. We look at the cool triangle. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's going to be square root of four minus x squared divided by two. And then these are now back to x. We're back to x, so zero and square root of two. So any questions before we evaluate any of that replacement stuff not make sense, Gabe? How are we replacing sine theta cosine theta and Did you say how are we like, what are we doing to replace the sine theta and the cosine theta? So we look at our triangle, sine of theta is x over two. So the sine part is going to replace with x over two. So this part right there. So sine of theta becomes x over 2. Cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. So cosine of theta is going to be replaced with that. You see it? <coughs> Any other questions before we evaluate? Before we go to our inverse trig function evaluation. Okay, 
let's plug in the square root of 2. So the square root of 2 goes in, and we ask ourselves, inverse sine of square root of 2 over 2, that says what angle on the right side of the unit circle has a sine value of root 2 over 2. And the angle on the right side of the unit circle with the sine value of root 2 over 2 is pi over 4. And then we come in here. Plug it in square root of 2. We have a minus sign. So square root of 2 goes in there. So we have a square root of 2 over 2. Right there, square root of 2 over 2. Plug in square root of 2 there. Square root of 2 squared is 2. 4 minus 2 is 2. So we have another square root of 2 right there. And then we subtract off the evaluation at 0. Inverse sine of 0. It's the angle on the right side of the circle with the sine value of 0. The angle on the right with the sine of 0 is? The angle on the right side of the circle with the sign of zero. Is there a two underneath the last, uh, last move? Nope. Because I moved it under this x. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, it's yeah. fine. I, I don't know why I moved it there instead of there. It could be in either place. <laughs> in fact, it's probably going to be go a clearer if, <laughs> if we look at it that way, maybe. Can you go take that root to the right of the top? Say, say that once again. Can you go over how you got root 2 out of the top when you put in the root 2 So root 2 times root 2 is 2. Yeah. 4 minus 2 is 2. Okay. You see it? Yeah. And then how about inverse sine of 0? The angle on the right. So inverse sine is always on the right. The angle on the right with the sine of 0 is 0 radians. No rotation. So that's 0. And then we subtract off a negative, which makes it a positive. Plug in 0 here. Uh, 0 goes right there. 0 times anything is 0. So we get another 0. So all of this reduces to pi divided by 2 minus 1. our value for that definite integral. Any step that you want to ask about? Yeah? How are you thinking through just doing the inverse sign, like in the value variable? Uh, so inverse sine and inverse tangent are on the right side of the circle. So inverse sine of, whoops, can't have an angle inside of an inverse function. Should be a ratio. So inverse sine, inverse sine of a number, inverse sine of t, that's an angle on the right. And inverse cosine is an angle where? Inverse cosine is an angle on top. So inverse cosine of a number, inverse cosine of a ratio, is the angle on top with cosine value of t. Inverse sine of t is angle on the right with the sine value of t. Inverse tangent is angle on the right with the tan value of t. Okay. So inverse sine and inverse tan on the right, inverse cosine on top. We'll do some more of those, for sure. Let's see. <laughs> All right, let's do this guy. So our tree, this one already has a 1. So we already have a sum of squares with a 1. That's perfect. We don't have to do any weird factorization. No algebra. We can just jump right into the trig sub. And we have to ask ourselves, sine, secant, or tangent? And which one do we think it is? Tangent. And the 
plus is the easiest one to remember. When there's a plus, it looks like a T. When there's a plus, it's always going to be tangent no matter what. So this is the one that's usually easiest for folks to recognize. Oh, plus, tangent. So we're going to let x equal tangent of theta. And then we take the derivative. We get secant squared of theta d theta. If we wanted to, we could draw the triangle right now if we wanted to. This one is going to be a relatively short problem, so let's draw it now. So there's our cool triangle, quadrant one. Tangent of theta has to be x. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. So that's how we would make tangent of theta equal to x. <coughs> the hypotenuse using the Pythagorean theorem is going to be the square root of 1 plus x squared. Pythagorean theorem. Let's go ahead and do our substitution over here. dx is secant squared of theta d theta. Right there, secant squared of theta d theta. Down in the denominator, we have 1 plus tangent squared. All raised to the 3 halves power. One plus tangent squared is secant squared. So we're going to have secant squared to the 3 halves, which is secant cubed. Secant squared raised to the 3 halves. We multiply the 2 and the 3 halves, and we get 3. So this all reduces to cosine. Two secants cancel. 1 divided by secant is cosine. Two secants cancel, we're left with a secant in the bottom, move it to the top and it becomes a cosine. It's a reciprocal. Reciprocal of secant is cosine. Now actually this one's probably the fastest one. Sine of theta plus c. But we're not done. We gotta get back to x. So we look at our triangle, and what is sine? Opposite over hypotenuse. So there's our family of antiderivatives. Yeah, that, that's definitely the quickest U sub or trig sub imaginable. All right, any stuff there you're not sure about? <laughs> all right, time for you all to try one. Try this one. Give it a shot. At least get to the point. You can make it all the way through that sign, but we'll start doing it once you get to the, once you're completely substituted before the evaluation. See if you can get that far. <coughs> so first step, factor out the 36. Factor out the 36. Let me know if you're snagged, pulling out the 36. Actually, I should just roll.
factor that 36 out, should it be in the numerator or the denominator? Denominator. Denominator. Are you able to pull it out then? So you can pull the 36 out. What has to come along with it? The one we did on the board here a little bit ago, we had a square root. So what has to come with it? The square. The square. The square has to come with it. So if we factor out that 36, this is what your first step should look like. So there was no 36 there, so we put a 36 in there. Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And how are we going to simplify that z squared over 36? Z over 6. Z over 6 quantity squared first, and then we're going to use tan. Yes. All right, keep on trucking. I'll write that step down that you just told me. Actually, it makes a lot more sense, that like, first step you do, because the book doesn't teach that. I know. That was like bad. Like I was doing it and it was like, God, it's impossible. <laughs> yeah, it, factor, there's a lot of reasons that it's, the more you do it, the more you realize, oh, it's super helpful to do a, make yeah. it a one. Yeah, because it makes you like. It also, it makes your plating, when you're doing this step, when you have one plus tan squared, it's easy to do that. Yeah, because like I like said A over B, and I was like, like uh-oh, <laughs> it's kind of complicated. <laughs> Yeah, as long as your algebra is good and your reverse yeah. chain rule is good, we've been yeah. doing reverse chain rule for a month, yeah. after five weeks. So it's better, in my opinion, to do that. And then you only have three formulas to memorize. You don't have to memorize any of the A over B stuff. Yeah. You just need the basics. We need the question. Yeah. I'm sorry, question. Why is it 36 squared? So this square, think about this. If we had x squared minus 36, and we factored this 36 out here, wouldn't this square root, wouldn't this come out as a 6? Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. So, so it's that type of thing. Whatever the power is, whether it's a 1 half or a square, it has to come out with that constant that you bring to the front. Gotcha. And like I said earlier, if you have to write, you know, a, a coefficient of 36 here, that's totally fine too, right? So then this 36 and this 36 are the ones that are coming to the front. And then you've got the z squared over 36, which you write as a single square. <clears throat> Once you've done all this algebra legwork, then it makes the calculus part way easier.
So again, the, the tangent one is always going to show up when you have a plus. So we're going to let z over 6 be tangent. And then we take the derivative of both sides. So on the left, the derivative of z over 6, that's 1 over 6 dz. And the derivative of tangent is secant squared of theta d theta. And that's, now we're going to plug all that stuff in to try to take every z that we see inside that integral, every one of those z's has to be turned into thetas. So let's see if we can do it step by step. So the 1 over 36 squared, let's just leave that. Let's not multiply that out. With trig sub, there's always things that cancel. So we'll just leave it as that for now. So when we look in the numerator, we have z squared. We come over here, and we see that z, if we wanted to isolate z, we multiply both sides by 6. So if z is 6 tan, z squared is 36 tangent squared. So that's that part of the numerator. So we're replacing z squared by looking at what z is equal to and then squaring it. And then how about dz? What is dz equal to? 6 secant squared, exactly, with a d theta at the end. So to replace the dz right there, we come down here. There's dz, we move the 6 to the right, and that replaces the dz. And then down in the denominator, we have z over 6. That's what our tangent is equal to, right? z over 6 is tangent. That's going to go right there. So we have tan squared plus 1. And then all of that is squared. And as soon as we switch to theta limits, we don't want to find theta limits. We'll just put little stars. We'll come back to the limits at the end. So is there any piece of that substitution that's not jiving? John? Yep. So the 6 secant squared, that's dz. You see it? So dz, we come over here, dz, we multiply both sides by 6 to isolate the dz, and that's going to go in right there. So dz gets turned into 6 secant squared. OK, so do we see that a factor of 36 cancels? One factor of 36 is going to cancel out in front. Oh, we also have a 6 out here. right? That 6 is going to come out. So that's going to, let's just write it as 6 over 36 for now. In the denominator, tangent squared plus 1 is secant squared. Secant squared squared is secant to the 
that secant to the fourth? So we have secant to the fourth right here. And we have a secant squared in the numerator. <laughs> cancel. Those will cancel. So we'll have one sixth. <coughs> star to double star. Tangent squared over secant squared. Now the most efficient way at this stage is to go to sines and cosines. You might say, this looks like one of those products with tangents and secants. But we had two rules. <laughs> we had a rule if secant was to an even power or tangent was to an odd power, and this doesn't match. So that's one clue that we might want to go to, secant, uh, go to sines and cosines. So going to sine and cosine, Sine and cosine. Do you see that that reduces to sine squared? So let's draw it out on the board. Let's make sure it's obvious. Let's just put it over here. So a lot of times if you're dealing with a pile of sines and cosines, you can just use S and C and just shorthand it. So we have tangent, which is sine squared over cosine squared, tangent squared, sine squared over cosine squared. And we're dividing by secant squared. Secant is 1 over cosine squared. Secant squared is 1 over cosine squared. And if we divide by a fraction, we multiply by its reciprocal. So this is sine squared over cosine squared times cosine squared over 1. Cosine squared will cancel. And now we are good to go with power reduction. So sine squared is 1 half integral 1 minus cosine t theta. Any confusion on that? So the one half is coming from the denominator in our power reduction identity. So the division by two for our power reduction, we usually are just going to pull it out to the front because in order to integrate this thing, we need to integrate term by term. So that division by two, we'll usually pull it out in front as a one half. And then we're good to integrate. So, <laughs> integral of 1 is theta, and then we have sine of 2 theta divided by 2. And then the still just lingering with stars. <clears throat> now we go to our double angle identity. I'm, I'll distribute this 1 12th also. So 1 12th theta. Sine of 2 theta is 2 sine theta cosine theta. So when we replace sine of 2 theta with 2 sine theta cosine theta, the 2's cancel. And so the 1 12th will then distribute, and we'll have minus 1 12th sine of theta cosine theta. We haven't figured out our limits yet. Now we're ready for the cool triangle. Cool triangle time. What was that? Was there a question coming? The star, yeah, I was looking at the star. I was like, wait, where did I get that? And then I realized you got it from the star. Yeah, so we go to the, as soon as we convert from z's to thetas, we'll just put the star limits on. I don't know if there's like, the order is like, 
you have to be very organized. <laughs> and you gotta be, because I was like doing everything everywhere and I had to like screw it all up. Yeah. <laughs> These ones you need to be like an accountant. Because yeah. there is so much stuff going on. So the cool triangle comes from our let statement. So we let we let the z over 6 be tangent. So now we draw our triangle like we're in quadrant one, counterclockwise rotation from the positive x. Tangent is rise over run, so z and 6. And then what will the hypotenuse be? Square root of 7, or uh, z squared plus 36. Correct. Exactly. Square root of z squared plus 36. <laughs> and when you look right here, this is going to allow us to isolate theta. Theta will be the inverse tangent of z over 6. So now we're ready to roll. We have 1 12th theta. Theta is arctan z by 6. Minus 1 12th sine of theta. We look at our triangle. Sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So we're going to get z over square root z squared plus 36. Cosine of theta, come over to our triangle. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. So that's going to be 6 divided by square root z squared plus 36. Now we can go back to our z limits, whatever they were, 6 and 6 root 3. Stare at that a minute, make sure that that's copacetic. We definitely have a cancellation of a 6 right here. That's going to turn into a 1. This will turn into a 2. Before we substitute it in, let's just rewrite it one more time. Let's combine those two denominators over there just to clean it up before we evaluate. Clean it up a little bit. So this is going to be z divided by z squared plus 36. All right. OK, so we're going to have to do some evaluation again of inverse tangent. Let me remind you with inverse tangent, or in general, so inverse tangent is always on the right side of the circle. And if we're at our typical places, pi over 6 and pi over 3, the slope of this line here is root 3. The slope of this line is root 3 over 3. <clears throat> slope is what tangent is equal to. Tangent is rise over run. If you were to look at your coordinates of these points, this point is 1 half comma root 3 over 2. Root 3 over 2 divided by 1 half is root 3. This point here is root 3 over 2, 1 half. This is 1 half divided by root 3 over 2 with the denominator rationalized. So knowing that those are the slopes of those lines are going to help us right now. Let's see. So plugging in 6 root 3, we have inverse tangent of root 3. Inverse tangent of root 3, angle on the right, that has a tangent value of root 3. Angle on the right, that has a tangent value of root 3. That means that the terminal ray has a slope of root 3. And what angle is that? Pi over 3. 
So the angle on the right with a tangent value of root 3 is pi divided by 3. <coughs> Minus, plugging in 6 root 3 here, we have 6 root 3 in the numerator. And in the denominator, we're going to have 36 times 3. Right? Everyone agree? If we square 30, if we square the 6, we get 36. If we square the root 3, we get a 3. So we're going to have 3 times 36 plus 1 times 36, which is 4 times 36. 3 times 36 plus 1 times 36 is 4 times 36. Now we plug in the 6. So subtract off 1 12th times inverse tangent of 1. Inverse tangent of 1. Angle on the right hand side of the unit circle with a tangent value of 1. What angle on the right has a tangent value of 1? Pi over, four. Pi over 4. Exactly. Pi over 4 is the angle on the right with a tangent value of 1. And then we subtract the negative, so we get plus 1 half times 6 over 72. We just have to simplify that thing. Okay, a little simplification. So this is pi over 36 minus we have we have this stuff here that we can simplify pretty easily. We'll make that two goes into there three times, two goes into there once, so we'll end up with that, and then 3 goes into there once, 3 goes into there 12 times. So it looks like root 3 over 48. And then this is pi over 48 plus 3 over 72. 3 goes into 72. 24 times. <clears throat> All right. Um, and then we can just get a common denominator and simplify it. We don't need to go through that. We'll just say et cetera at this point. You can get a common denominator there. I said that in the past. Yes. Sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can say whatever you want. It's an optic sign. Right. I can't so wait to see that. that. <laughs> this is my right pen. You know. <laughs> All right, let's take a break. We need 10 minutes of breaking. 10 minutes of breaking. Started on this one together then. So the, the 2x here. We want to replace that with secant because when we look at this identity, secant squared minus 1 can turn into tan squared. So we're going to go secant of theta is equal to 2x. And then when we differentiate, we're going to get secant theta tangent theta d theta is equal to 2dx. So that's going to put us in a position where we can start turning all the x's into thetas. If you need to, if it's easier for you to write out that this means that x is equal to 1 half secant theta, if you have to write that out, of course, there's no problem doing that. You can do that. And here, if you need to write out the dx, if you can't just see that the 2's in the denominator over here, then just you know, make one extra step. So isolate the dx. dx will be 1 half secant theta tangent theta. But don't forget your d thetas. All right, so let's try our substitution then. 2x is secant. So this is going to be secant squared minus 1 in here. 
the denominator is x squared, so that's one fourth secant squared. All right, so we take this x and we square it, that's one fourth and that's secant squared. And now the dx, that's down here, so that's one half secant tangent. This turns into a constant out in front of 2. 1 fourth here, dividing by 1 fourth means multiplying by 4. And then 4 times 1 half is 2. Is that OK with everyone? Or you could say to yourself, 1 half divided by 1 fourth is 2. There's 2 quarters and a half. If, you're, if you cook, that's how you would do it. Okay, so secant squared minus 1 is tangent squared. This numerator becomes tangent right there. So this all becomes tangent. Square root of tan squared is tangent. We have another tangent over here that's going to jump on top of that tangent. So we have tangent squared. So we have a tangent from the square root. We have a tangent there. And then doesn't one of the secants in the denominator cancel? So we end up with that. So that is how it all simplifies down. And the last one that we had that looks similar to this, we turned everything to sine and cosine. Here it's not going to help us so much. But like as I look at this, the last one we had tan squared over secant squared. And so you could see, see that the cosine squareds were going to cancel. That's not going to happen here. So I think this one, we're probably better off just using a Pythagorean identity. So here, tangent squared, if we look over at this identity, is secant squared minus 1. <clears throat> and you certainly can go to sines and cosines, and it will work out. But I think this will be faster. Yeah? Oh, sorry, where does the half come from again in front of the secant tangent? This half right there? Yeah. So right up here, when we differentiate this, we get seek tan equals 2dx. We divide both sides by 2 to isolate the dx. So this dx right here is what we're replacing. Dx is 1 half. Oh, okay. Do you see it? Yes. That whole thing. I see. Okay, yeah, because it's when... Okay, I understand that. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, so now we're going to split the fraction. Splitting the fraction is going to give us 2 integral of secant theta minus cosine theta. Split the fraction. We have secant squared over secant, which is secant, and 1 over secant, which is cosine. Integral of secant, natural log, absolute secant plus tangent. We did that one a bunch last class. All right, so secant integrates the natural log of secant plus tangent minus integral of cosine of sine plus secant. Go grab that let statement because we're going to need it to build our cool triangle. Secant of theta is 2x. So triangle again, always as if it's in quadrant 1 with theta right there. Secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. So we're going to do it like this. Hypotenuse over adjacent for secant. <clears throat> Which makes this vertical distance here, this vertical leg, the square root of 4x squared minus 1. What's the Pythagorean theorem? Now we're ready. Go back 
back to x. I'm going to distribute this 2. So we have 2, natural log, absolute value. Secant of theta is 2x plus tangent of theta, opposite over adjacent from our cool triangle. So natural log of that, and then minus 2 times sine of theta. Sine of theta, we look at our triangle, it's opposite over hypotenuse. So it's 2 multiplied by the square root of 4x squared minus 1, divided by 2x. Uh, plus C. And the only simplification we have is that we can annihilate those twos. And that is, that's as good as it gets. Our family of antiderivatives. Question. I don't sure. Know, I don't know how we uh, evaluated the integral. How we got went from like secant to like ln. Uh, the, in the right here, the integral of secant. That one. Um, like the step before, how we went from from here step to here. To that, yeah. So we did that last time. Let me remind you. So we did it on that slide where. So uh, this slide right here. So if we integrate secant, the other four trig functions besides sine and cosine all integrate to logs, which is what this slide is representing. They all integrate to logs. So we went through the fact that if they integrate to logs, they must be massageable into log form. Secant is the one that shows up a ton. So this is one that I highly recommend you paying attention to just because it shows up so much. And so what we said was, we need to multiply by 1 to put it in log form. And if we multiply up and down by secant plus tangent, it's in log form. The derivative of secant is secant times tangent. And the derivative of tangent is secant times secant, secant squared. So it's in log form if you multiply top and bottom by secant plus tangent. <clears throat> so that, once it's in log form, the integral is the natural log of the denominator. Oh, I see. Okay. Right. So yeah, take a look at that one, because that one will show up so frequently that it's just really, really good to know. So that's what we're doing right here. When we integrate secant, natural log of secant plus tangent, integral of cosine is sine. Yeah, Brody? I'm assuming we don't get a formula plus on this one either. Uh, not plan. I mean, there's going to be some things that are given to you, like if you had to use a reduction identity other than sine squared or cosine squared. Okay. But yeah, all the basic, that type of integral you would want to know. Okay. Are we expected to have the sign of two sacred equal to sine of three times integral? Definitely these three, yeah. Because okay. those three we're going to use all the time. I mean, for sure the first, uh, first two. Yeah, yeah. You want to know that, that, and that for sure. Yeah, that will, it just shows up so much. Okay, so let's go ahead and do this one. What do you think, sine, secant, or tangent? Secant, secant right? Secant, because it's, we're going to try to force this into a difference of squares with a trailing one, so we'll factor out the 64 so that we get a difference of squares with a trailing one. And the difference of squares with the trailing one will be secant. So we have 8 root 2 and 16 as our limits. I'm factoring the 64 out of the denominator so it stays in the denominator. And what will our single square in there be? If we factor out the 64, how will we write that part? X over 8 squared? Yeah, X over 8 squared. So we're thinking of this as 64 over 64. Once we factor out this 64 and that 64, we're left with x squared over 64, which is x divided by 8 squared. So now we're in position to do trig sub. 
We did all our algebra. So the 64 is factored out in the denominator. So that's why it's a 1 8, because it's in the denominator. And the 64 is coming through the root, so that square root is attached to that 64 as it comes out, making it an 8. So now we're going to let x over 8 be secant. So x divided by 8 is secant of theta. Take the derivative of the left, and we get 1 8 times dx. Take the derivative of the right, we get secant theta tangent theta d theta. We're good to substitute now. So we have the 1 8 out in front. We're going to go with star limits because we're not going to convert to theta limits. They limits our pain. What is dx equal to if you look down here? 8 times secant tangent. Exactly. So if we want to replace the dx, we look down here and say, oh, dx is. 8 times that, so we'll have 8 secant theta tangent theta. So that's our dx, and then a d theta. <coughs> Down in the denominator, we have square root of secant squared minus 1. So now we've changed all the x's to thetas. Eight and the one eighth cancel. <clears throat> so we have secant theta, tangent theta. All right, downstairs, secant squared minus one, tangent squared, square root of tangent squared, tangent. get some nice cancellation here. Tangent and tangent annihilate each other. And integral of secant is natural log of secant plus tangent. Just shows up so much. So cool triangle time. Always draw it the same way every time. Always put your theta in the lower left. Secant. Hypotenuse over adjacent. Secant of theta, hypotenuse over adjacent. Opposite side will be the hypotenuse squared minus the adjacent squared, all square rooted. This allows us to come in here and do some funny business. Secant of theta, that's x divided by 8. Tangent of theta is the square root of x squared minus 64 divided by 8. Now we can go back to our original limits, our x limits, 8 root 2 and 16. Any step before we do our final evaluation with the limits? Any piece up there that you aren't 100% sure on? Absolutely. You know, and I should, let me show you one thing that the, you're going to see in my math lab, if, which is interesting. So, 
great suggestion here. It's like, oh yeah, this is one fraction. So you know the log property that says the log of a fraction is a difference of logs. So you could write this as natural log of x plus root that minus natural log of 8. We still have our limit that here, 8 root 2 and 16. Everyone follow that? Follow that? So now in the book, if this was an indefinite integral, not a definite integral, so if this stuff wasn't here and you had a plus C, many of you will come to this stage right here and write plus C and think that you're, you know, and, and it's good, that's fine, it's true. But the book will often say, oh, let's rewrite it with this natural log of 8 and then let's combine the natural log of 8 with the C and just write it as this plus C. <clears throat> and that's what they're doing. So if you had a, pl a plus C out here, they would then say, oh, all of this, you can just take that away because a constant plus a constant is a constant. So you will get into my math lab and you may think that you're done and then you look and your answer is a little different. And a lot of times it's because they do this log property and they're gonna combine with the constant. So just be aware of that. They may, they may throw in a very clever log property to simplify things. <clears throat> okay, so let me ask you this. We know when you're doing an indefinite integral here, or, or even a definite integral, when you do this integral piece, you just need any antiderivative, right? Any antiderivative. So for example, if we were integrating, um, say we're in just integrating x squared on the interval 1 to 3. When we do this, we just choose the, the antiderivative that has a constant of 0. But if you wanted, you could have done this. This is an antiderivative for x squared. You all agree? Right? That's an antiderivative. You could do this. You don't have to always pick the antiderivative with a constant of zero. Let's see, does it work? So when you plug in your three, you're gonna get three cubed, which is 27, divided by three, which is nine. So you're gonna get nine plus four. I'm not gonna combine them, just for the heck of it. <clears throat> and then if we plug in the one, we're gonna get one third plus four, subtract it off. Do you see that these fours just cancel? So we end up with nine minus a third, which is whatever it's going to be equal to, 26 thirds, I think. So it doesn't matter which antiderivative you pick. You can pick whichever one you want. So over here, when we did this ln thing, this is just another antiderivative. You could just get rid of this. This is not going to matter because it's going to subtract itself away just like this 4 subtracted itself away. So if you wanted to be super clever, you could just cancel that thing out. Let's watch what happens if we leave it in. It's going to cancel each other. It's going to cancel out anyway. So when we plug in the 16, ugh, whatever we get in here, we get 16 plus 16 squared is 256. 256 minus 64. 192, 192, and we have minus natural log of 8. But now we're going to subtract off the evaluation at 8 root 2. So we subtract off natural log. We plug in our 8 root 2. 8 root 2 here is 64 times 2 which is 128, 128 minus 64 is 64, we get minus 8. And then we're subtracting off, so then we get plus natural log of 8. Because this is part of the antiderivative. So it comes along, and we see, oh yeah, that thing cancels with that thing. So it didn't matter in the first place. Once we get this antiderivative here, we could just get rid of that. 
So there is our final answer. We have natural log. And a subtraction turns into a division. So we have 16 plus, and I think 192 can reduce. What does that reduce to? 8 squared of 3. And in the denominator, we have 8 squared of 2 minus 8. And that's absolute value. And then we can divide out an 8. We divide everything by 8. We get 2 plus root 3 in the numerator. Divide out an 8 down there, and we get square root of 2 minus 1. So there's various forms that this answer could take, but that's, that one's fine. Yeah, so that antiderivative thing, is this something you're all totally aware of before? Does this make sense? You just choose the antiderivative with zero, makes the most sense because the constant that you pick is going to cancel anyway when you do the subtraction. Why do you get a constant on the for a natural log? Is there a reason? Say that once again? Is there a reason why you get a constant on natural logs, I noticed? Like, because I was doing a few of the equations and they're giving us, like you said, like, oh, it's just giving us a constant, like minus natural log of eight. Or, Yep. Minus natural log of something. Is there like a reason why? I mean, it only, it only is going to happen in this triangle if you have sines and cosines, um, or, or whatever, uh, not sines and cosines. In this case, because the constant is here, it would have to be tangents. Oh, if you didn't have that constant, then it would be So okay. it's because it happens when the denominator lines up with whatever side is constant. Oh. In all these triangles, one side is always going to be constant. There's another one up there where there's where the hypotenuse is constant. So there's always one side that's going to have a constant. And if over here you are ending up with the trig function that has that constant in the denominator, then it's going to work. Oh, okay. So for us in this one, that's our denominator. We would be having tangents and secants. That one over there, you'd have sines and cosines. If you had sines and cosines, like sine of theta would be x over 2, cosine of theta would be the square root over 2. So if we had sines and cosines here, we could do the same thing. We'd end up with a log thing that you, know, you can subtract it off. But the first time you see it in my math lab, you're like, wait, what? They just erased the denominator. The reason is because it's a constant that you can use log property for. Are they going to explain that? Yeah, they don't explain it. <laughs> <laughs> they just that's do why it. I was questioning. Like, like, they're just like, that's called a geometry. You should understand. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they, no, they don't explain it. <laughs> oh my god, you have high expectations. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's just take a look at this one. Um, before I work this one out in detail, oh, I forgot there was a second one there. Um, let me ask you this. So if you had the integral of dx over x squared plus 9, that is an inverse tangent type of integral. And the way we've been just dealing with things by factoring and making the 1 is really helpful here. So like I said, if you know the integral of x squared plus 1 is arctan, all we have to do is create a 1 there and then use reverse chain rule and not remember an extra integral formula. So if we factor out the 9, there's no 9 here. So when it comes through this, it puts a 9 in the denominator. And we would write this as x divided by 3 quantity squared. Now it's perfectly set to integrate to arctangent. I'm going to leave a space for a reverse chain rule. Now it's arctangent of x over 3 plus c. What is the reverse chain rule piece? What's the derivative of x over 3? One third. One third. So we divide by 1 third, which means multiply by 3. And this gives us our answer. So if we know our basic arctan, plus we know how to do reverse chain rule, 
we don't have to remember anything about this front being um, you know, 1 over a, which is nice. You can, if you just know the basic three, I can pro trust me, in two years, if someone says, which of the inverse trig functions have a 1 over a out in front, the chances of remembering that are pretty small. But the chances of rem remembering reverse chain rule, because we do it so much, is very good. And the chances of remembering your basic inverse tan should be pretty solid, because we use it so much. So that's a good reason why making it a sum of squares with one is a good idea. You have to remember less in the long run. So complete the square. All right. When we look at this, divide 6 by 2, you get 3. You know you need a 9. So to make this a perfect square trinomial, we need a 9. So we're going to take the 9 out of the 34, leaving us with a 25. Does that make sense? So we're just completing the square. We know we need a 9. So we're just going to borrow that 9 from the 34, or take it from the 34. We're not going to give it back. So this will be x minus 3 squared plus 25. <coughs> So when we're staring at that, that is an arctan type of integral. But we would like to have it be in arctan form, which I mean a plus 1. So we're going to factor out the 25 from the integral. Well, when we factor out that 25, there's no 25 with this x minus 3 part. So it introduces a 5 in the denominator, right, like that. Does everybody follow that? So once again, if you're, it's not totally clear, you can just say, oh, well, I want to factor a 25 out. There's no 25 there, so let's just put one. You can always just multiply by 1. And when that 25 factors out to the front, we're left with x minus 3 squared over 25. We want to write it as a single square. So we write it as x minus 3 over 5 quantity squared. Now we are in arctan land. So this is 1 25th. Space for reverse chain rule. This is going to be arctangent of x minus 3 divided by 5 plus c. Reverse chain rule. We look inside the parentheses. What's the derivative? One over five, everyone agree? One over five is the derivative. Dividing by one over five means multiplying by five over one. And then we just simplify and we've got our final answer. Okay, you all try this one. Same kind of idea. I would factor out the 2 first, just that's not jumping out at you. Just notice that there's a common factor of 2 that can come all the way to the front. When you complete the square, you have to have a leading coefficient of 1. So you want to pull that 2. You have to pull that 2 out to complete the square properly.
So everyone has seen that we want to split the 18 into a 9 and a 9. So we take the 6, divide by 2, and square it. That's 9. So we need that 9 to complete the square. So this will be 1 half integral du over u uh, minus 3 squared. <laughs> Now at this stage, we're going to try to factor out that 9. Ideally, we have that denominator as u squared plus 1, or whatever, you know, x squared plus 1, that form. So when we factor out that 9, that 9 is in the denominator, so that makes it 1 18th. And then this is going to be du. There is no 9 here, so it's going to introduce a 9 in the denominator, but then we want to write it as a single square, so it's going to be u minus 3 over 3, quantity squared plus 1. And now we've got our arctan. We've got the most refined arctan form possible. We've got the sum of squares with a 1. So that's going to be arctangent of that parenthetical quantity. And what's the derivative of the inside there? One third. So divide by one third means multiply by 3. And that's our answer. hardest section in chapter 8 for sure. Getting all of the nuts and bolts of this trick stuff stuff down. The next section is the easiest section in chapter 8. PFD. Partial fraction decomposition. PFD. So let's just notice that in algebra, you went this direction to the left all the time. You were asked to add two rational expressions. You got a common denominator. You know, multiply by x plus 4 over x plus 4, x minus 2 over x minus 2, and you went over to here. That's hard to integrate, though. Like, that's not obvious. But if we were over here, that's easy to integrate. What form are these in? Natural logs. Those both are natural logs. This is going to be natural log absolute x minus 2 plus 2 times natural log of absolute x plus 4 plus c. You can do some combining if you want. But that's easy to integrate. So what we would want, if we could take stuff like this and rewrite it like that, we'd be golden. That's so much easier to integrate. Now, going this direction, you're adding rational functions. That you already know how to do. What we're going to try to do is go this direction, which is the method of partial fraction decomposition, PFD, partial fraction decomposition. Notice that this denominator right here factors into x plus 4 and x minus 2. So if we look at the factors of the denominator, those are going to be the denominators of the partial fractions. That's going to be our strategy, is to factor the denominator, 
separate into two partial fractions if we have two factors, and then figure out the constants for the numerators. So that's our goal. And it is really just college algebra. Don't look at that. That's scary. That's terrifying. You can ignore that slide. So if we've got these denominators, this denominator factored, what we're going to do is take our fraction. We've got it factored already. And like we saw on the last slide, this is going to be able to be decomposed into these two partial fractions where we don't know what the constants are. We have to find them. So that's what we're going to do. And that's what this box up here is saying. It's saying if you have linear factors in the denominator, so the denominator is factoring into all these linear factors, x minus 1, x minus 2, x minus 5, x plus 7, all these linear factors, then the partial fraction decomposition is a constant divided by each of those representative factors. So that's what that's saying. So it's saying that if you can factor the denominator into a bunch of linears, you just decompose into a bunch of fractions where each one of those factors of the denominator is a denominator all by itself. So we're breaking it apart. We're decomposing this denominator into these separate denominators. Now we're in college algebra. We have a system. So here's how we solve it. We multiply both sides by the LCD, this denominator over here. So when we multiply, we get some cancellation on the right. If we multiply the right-hand side by this, the x minus 2 is canceled for this one, and the x plus 6 is canceled for that one. And we get that. <clears throat> All right. So now I'm going to distribute on the right. And then I'm going to group things. I'm going to group things so that the x's are together and the constants are together. So these guys over here, there's no x, so that's part of a constant. That's all constant. The a and the b are numbers, so this will just be a number. And I want you to answer this question. If I have 5x minus 1 equals ax plus b, what does a have to be? What does b have to be? If you have two polynomials that are set equal, corresponding coefficients have to match. No brainer, right? If you have two polynomials that are equal, the corresponding coefficients have to be the same. How else could they be equal? All right. So that's what's going on right here. On the left, we have, let's put it in, we have 0x plus 8. On the right, we have a polynomial. This is the coefficient of x. And this is the constant. So the system that we're going to build says the number in front of x on the left better match the number in front of x on the right. So 0 must equal a plus b. The constant on the left, that better match the constant on the right. So from that equation, we can develop a system with two unknowns and two equations. We can divide the bottom equation by 2. Whoops. 8 divided by 2 is 4. So we have those two equations. And now you can do whatever technique floats your boat. You can use elimination. You can use substitution. Does not matter. This one is very easy to do with elimination. If I add those two equations, 
we're going to get 4 equals 4a. So a is 1. Once we have A, we back substitute it to get B. What does B have to be? If we plug A equals 1 in right there and solve for B, B is negative 1. You could also plug it in here. Plug in A equals 1 here. That's 3. Subtract. If you have 1 equals negative B, uh, divide by negative 1, you'll get B equals negative 1 also. So... Now, we are going to rewrite our integral. So this is going to be the integral of a is 1. So we have 1 over x minus 2. b is negative 1, so we have minus 1 over x plus 6. So there's our PFD. We took this fraction and broke it apart into two little fractions, two partial fractions. And that's super easy to integrate. We have the natural log of absolute x minus 2 minus the natural log of x plus 6 plus c. And if we wanted to, we would combine these into natural log absolute x minus 2 over x plus 6. So that is PFD. I might have missed this part. How come the B's don't cancel when you add them? They do. There's no B. When I add these, the B's are gone. So then how is a negative 1? So when we add these equations, 0 plus 4 is 4, A plus 3A is 4A, B plus negative B is 0. So now I have this equation, divide both sides by 4. Yeah. A is 1. And now we back substitute the A in uh, here to get the B. Okay. You see it? Yep. So when we back substitute in, we isolate B, and we'll get the B is negative 1. Question, when was that just that whole thing taught? Because I, I don't remember when they could just add the equations together. Uh, college algebra is where you would do systems of equations. Actually, you do it in Math 055, Algebra 2. You do systems of equations. Usually, you do three equations and three unknowns, two equations and two unknowns. You can, so that's the elimination method where you add them or subtract them. And then there's also substitution. You could solve this equation for A and then plug it in down here and get B. So it kind of depends on what your teacher emphasized. Usually you do both substitution and elimination. Elimination tends to be a little bit sort of slicker. Substitution, you can do it. It will work out just fine, though. So this method that we just chose, that we just did, this is called the traditional method, where we build a polynomial equal to another polynomial, and we equate the corresponding coefficients. Now, here is the slick method, the convenient value method. Sounds convenient. It is super convenient, trust me. It's so convenient that it's going to blow your mind. <laughs> OK, so this equation right here, let's take this equation, and let's um, Analyze it for a second. Oh, do I have to click this right click button? Um, let's analyze it in the following way. Let me draw it. Okay. So this equation, so this new method is called the convenient value method. This equation is true. It's an identity for all x's. It doesn't matter what x you plug in there. That needs to be true. Once you find your a and your b, if you plug your a and your b in here, this equation is true for all x. In particular, it's true for two very convenient x's. It is true for x <laughs> equals, bless you, it's true for x equals 0. There's two more better values, though. x equals 2. It's true for x equals 2 x and, equals negative six. and x equals negative 6. So watch what happens. So these are the quote unquote convenient values. If, you, if this equation is true for every single x, let's just pick 
x equals negative 6 and x equals 2. If we plug in x equals negative 6, doesn't this whole term just disappear? And so then we plug in negative 6 over here, and we get negative 8b. So that tells us that b is negative 1. Plug in x equals 2, we have 8 on the left. X, plug in x equals positive 2. Did I say negative 2? Plug in x equals 2, we get 8a. And doesn't the 2 plugged in here give 0? And now we divide by 8, and we get a is equal to 1. Same values that we got over here, but way less work. The convenient value method works really slickly as long as you have linear factors. If you don't have linear factors, if we ended up with quadratic factors here, irreducible quadratics, the convenient value method does not work as well for that. But for linear factors in the denominator, the convenient value method, hands down, is the fastest way to go. So let's try this one with convenient value method. So let's factor the denominator. This is going to factor into x and then x squared minus 1. So we're going to end up with x, x minus 1, and x plus 1. Okay, so we're going to take our inside, the inside rational function, and we're going to try to decompose this. And how many fractions are we going to have? How many partial fractions? Three. We're going to have one for each factor. So we're going to have a over our first linear factor plus b over our second linear factor plus c over our third linear factor. So that is the decomposition step. We're going to decompose this rational function into three partial fractions. Now we do the college algebra stuff. We want to solve for a, b, and c. Multiply both sides by this denominator on the left. So if we multiply the left by that denominator, they cancel. And on the right, when we multiply this denominator times this fraction, the x's cancel. So we have a times x minus 1 times a x plus 1. When we take this denominator and we multiply it by the middle term, the x minus 1's cancel, and we're left with b times x times x plus 1. And then when we multiply it by the third fraction, so this denominator is getting multiplied by each of these fractions. So that denominator multiplied over here, the x plus 1's cancel. We get c times x times x minus 1. We have all linear factors. So let's see. Let's pick our convenient values. What's the first convenient value? x equals 0. zero. All right. That causes this factor to be 0. What's our second convenient value? One. one. Third one? Negative one. Negative one. So here's what we do. So we come to this equation, and we plug in each of our convenient values. So first, zero. On the left, when we plug in zero, we have negative two. On the right, when we plug in x equals zero, these two terms are just going to disappear. If you plug in a zero there and there, those are gone. So over here, you plug in 0. Negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. So we have negative a. Solve for a. We get a is 2. Now we plug in the convenient value of 1. 4 times 1 minus 2. That's 2. On the right, if you plug in a 1 here, this is gone. Plug in a 1 there, that's gone. Plug in a 1 here, we have 2 times b. So b is 1. Convenient value, negative 1. That's negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. On the right, gone, gone. Plugging in negative 1 here is negative 1 times negative 2, which is 2c. So c is negative 3. <clears throat> so we have a over x. We have b over x minus 1. We have 
c over x plus 1, that's a super easy integral. We now have two, we now have three partial fractions, all of which are logs. This will be 2 natural log absolute x plus natural log absolute x minus 1 minus 3 natural log absolute x plus 1. <laughs> and that's fine. We can leave it right like that. You don't need to use log properties. I don't care. My math lab sometimes will want you to use log properties. On the test, that's fine. You don't need to go finagle. Now, if you wanted to, if you wanted to combine this, let me make sure that you see it. This 2 has to come up as a power. And then on the inside here, we're going to have a numerator and a denominator. This part's going to be in the denominator, x plus 1 cubed. And I should really leave that as an absolute value. I'll do it in a second. So it's x squared. This one is going to be x minus 1. And this should be absolute value. <coughs> Everybody follow that? So we, the plus ones get multiplied together, but you have to move your coefficients up first. The minus one goes into the denominator, but you need to move the power up. So that would be the way we could write it in one form. I don't care on the test. OK, any questions on that before we vanish? If you have questions, you can stay and ask. I'll be here for a little bit. If not, I will see you on Thursday. Good luck doing trigonometric substitution. Khan Academy has a bunch of trig sub also. My math lab has a ton of trig sub. Trig sub is everywhere online. If you feel like you want to look at a few more videos of you know, someone doing trig sub. Uh, yeah. You can please Chris Atrium do some Thursday.